Hi, we've got a great show for you today. We're going to talk more about the NGA. You know they're staying here in St. Louis and they're going to do some wonderful things throughout the community. Also, let's learn more about Window O. Pruitt. Come on back. Hi, I'm Robin Boyce for City Corner. Thank you for staying with us today. We've got a great show ahead of us, but first in the studios with me is an artist who I've met several, several years ago and his son who've done some really great portraits. But this man really created, along with someone else, a wonderful mural at St. Louis Lambert Airport that deals with the history of black aviators. And we're here to talk about the history of Wendell O. Pruitt and that artist who created that wonderful mural by the name of Thurman, uh, Solomon Thurman, who's artist, and he owns the 10th Street Gallery. How you doing, Mr. Solomon? Hello, Robin, how you doing? So man? good to see you. Nice seeing you. Known you for many, many years now, yes. and watched you all put that whole, Mr. Mr. Spencer, put that mural together. That right. was just phenomenal. Tell us a little bit about the history of the mural at the airport and uh, how it got its start. Well, the mural got its start through the installation of a Siegfried Reinhardt mural called American Triumph, which was unveiled when Lambert International Airport's new terminal was built in 1983. Right. And then once that mural came up, it did not have any African Americans on that mural, and it was considered an oversight. Hmm. Because of that, uh, they wanted to do something about it. Uh, Reinhardt agreed to insert an African American in there, but okay. unfortunately, he passed away within 30 days of making that commitment. So. Uh, Vince Shamel, the then mayor, put together an oversight committee mm -hmm. that included some of the prominent citizens in St. Louis, and one of them happens to be Vesta Pruitt, the sister-in-law of Wendell O. Pruitt. Okay. And they, she headed up that committee to pull things together. She became the president of that committee called mm -hmm. CAMPS, the acronym that stands for the Committee for the Aviation Mural Project Success. Mm -hmm. And they were formed specifically for that purpose only, to create that mural. That's excellent. Tell us how you and Spencer, was it Spencer Taylor? Spencer Taylor. Spencer Taylor. How did you and Mr. Spencer Taylor put that together? Well, we put it together once we got the commission from the camps committee mm -hmm. who selected us to do that mural. Mm -hmm. That was in 1985. And that began the research part of it to see what could happen and what that mural could look like. Mm -hmm. It began as an outline, so everybody's putting their input on the individuals who came from St. Louis. And of course, prominent in that selection was Wendell O. Pruitt. Tuskegee Airmen. Not only him, but also 22 other pilots mm -hmm. from St. Louis who flew in World War II. So they were considered an oversight in the sense of the original mural. And a second mural was then uh, commissioned by the camps committee for yes. Spencer and I to do. So we started in 85. It took two and a half years of actual research and collecting the material. And then once that material was collected, it took another two and a half years to actually paint it. It was unveiled August 13th, 1990. Wow, so you, oh, that's almost what? Uh, 30 year anniversary 30, coming up. That's coming up in August, as a matter of fact, correct? Exactly. It, now, it took you a while to put all of those panels together because you have, you started like a true black aviation history there. You've right. got um, presidents and um, former aviation people, but you started with a, a black female. Uh, what we aviator, did right? was. Uh, we took the information that we had, looked at the information, mm -hmm. and decided to dissect it in five parts. One being pre-Tuskegee, Tuskegee being World War II. So the people who were instrumental in African American, or actually aviation from an African American perspective, started during World War I with Eugene Jock Bullard, and also with Bessie Coleman. Those are the two figures who lead the mural. And that was in panel one. Panel two was the Tuskegee Airmen who showcased, or at least highlighted themselves among the group of Tuskegee Airmen. That was in the second panel. The third panel was devoted exclusively for the St. Louis individuals who were part of the Tuskegee Airmen mm -hmm. in, World, in World War II, and that was the panel three. Mm -hmm. Panel four was the contemporary portion of it, so after World War II, and some of the African Americans who exceeded in their position uh, 
specific mm -hmm. professions, but also all the branches of government were yes. represented mm -hmm. in panel four. And then panel five concluded with the space age panel. That, and that's really exciting to see all of the uh, black astronauts who were past and present, who, right. who are all about the, the uh, NASA program and, exactly. and how it developed and some of the things that they were able to do. Um, in, in placing and putting that together, Wendell uh, O. Pruitt is a very prominent figure yes. on that panel. Um, yes. The reasons for you doing that, tell us. Well, let me say, uh, if you look at the mural, mm -hmm. there are a myriad of sizes as far as individuals concerned. And those sizes were based on their importance on in the history of African American aviation. Mm -hmm. And when we say African American aviation, it only means that they were part of aviation history mm -hmm. with the African American uh, emphasis. Mm -hmm. So that's what I wanted to spotlight. It wasn't a different Air Force. No, no, it was, no. It's all the same. They were it, Army, right? It was the same U.S. military. In fact, he was trained at Lincoln University in Jefferson City. Is that correct? He was part of the Civilian Corps Air Force or Air Corps who learned pilot training as a result of preparing for World War II because President Roosevelt understood during the Lend-Lease Law mm -hmm. that a war was coming, whether or not politics sort of debated whether or not they should or shouldn't be involved. Mm -hmm. He knew that England needed help so that was part of the land lease law, but also they wanted to include and energize the country into manufacturing goods for war mm -hmm. and providing war materials for England, prepared us for the war materials that would be in use mm -hmm. during World War II mm -hmm. from the United States perspective. Now, Wendell Oprah was what you call an ace pilot. This he man, became an ace pilot. He became an ace pilot after um, um, becoming a Tuskegee Airman. Right. And he was the kind of person that had a different kind of way of really taking out his enemy. His special uh, secret was what? His special secret was he was a lefty. Okay. <laughs> he was a left-handed, so he did everything opposite of what everyone else did. So he became unpredictable in that sense that, you know, instead of people would think that he would go right, he would actually go left, you know, and things like that. So he was so, he took out destroyers in the ocean, correct? Well, he did something that him and uh, again Pearson, who was his wingman at the time. And you've got him on the yeah, uh, mural as well. Mm -hmm. He's there. Uh, what they did was, they did something that had never been done, and what they did was uh, they sunk a German destroyer with machine gun fire. Wow. And they were going over the Adriatic Sea, returning the base, and they were in, stationed in North Africa. And as they were on their way back home, they saw a German destroyer over the Adriatic Sea mm -hmm. and went to buzz it. And then Wendell Pruitt opened up with machine gun fire at the German destroyer and just happened to hit the magazine where the oh. ammunition is stored on the ship, which caused the ship to explode and wow. sink. Wow. And each time a machine gun uh, is activated on an aircraft, it automatically activates the cameras that are on board of the cam of the uh, of the of the aircraft. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. they so Pruitt was able to take out a lot of the enemy at that time. The Tuskegee Airmen, along with Pruitt, with those individuals who also escorted U.S. bombers overseas. Right. One of their assignments yes. was as part of the 15th Air Force was to escort bombers. That was the job of fighter pilots anyway. You know, they did sorties on their own as far as, you know, going out and, you know, creating havoc among railroad travel and that type of thing. But their main objective was to support the bombers. The bombers didn't travel more than the B-25s, couldn't go further than, faster than 250 miles an hour. Mm -hmm. And of course, the uh, ME-109s could go up to 375 in their speed, so they could easily catch up with a bomber and shoot it down. The only thing that would stop that from happening was that if there was a U.S. fighter escort that could intercept the ME-109s mm -hmm. and then discourage them from shooting at the bombers. The Tuskegee Airmen were known for always getting them over there and getting them back safely. Well, one of the things they had was a uh, general, or actually he was a colonel at the time, mm -hmm. was uh, Benjamin O. Davis, and he mandated that the fighters would never leave the bombers because the Germans had a trick. What they would do would, as the bombers were going toward their missions, they would cause the fighters mm -hmm. and steer them away mm -hmm. from the escorts by getting them engaged because the fighter pilot always wanted to get an air-to-air -air kill. 
that was their goal, okay. you know, to rack up up to five. Once you get five, you become an ace. And the Germans had a method where they would come in and attack the bombers, and some of the fighter pilots would go off and chase some of the fighters. Okay. And during the chase, that would open up a second group of fighters that would come in and then shoot at the aircraft. Mm -hmm. B.O. Davis would say, or Benjamin Oliver Davis, mm -hmm. said that never leave your escort. So okay. even if a uh, ME-109 or German fighters would come in and attack the group, you would never to leave it. You know, you would defend it, mm -hmm. but not go off and chase them. And but these guys were so successful in doing what they did, and they did this, from what I understand, uh, the terminology in the movie that was most recently done uh, called Red Tails. Right. Explain to us why those planes, or why that group of pilots had planes called Ra Red Tails. Well, they became red tails because the, the jets that they, or the fighter jets that they used, or they weren't jets, excuse me, they were actually props. Right. But the fighter planes mm -hmm. that they used were secondhand. They mm -hmm. came from other units, and the other unit insignia would be painted onto the tails. Wow. So as they received these secondhand aircraft, mm -hmm. they would paint out the former mm -hmm. insignia by using red paint. That's what they had a lot of. So that's how they became Being red, red tails. tails. But they were very successful. Getting back to Rwendo Pruitt, he was a, a prominent figure in the country for what he had done. Right. And um, also a prominent figure here in the St. Louis area. And a lot of people didn't know that the, uh, the uh, development, the housing development that was built um, in back in the 50s? 55. Was, 50, was it 55? That's, that was the first year okay. that they started bringing in uh, right. tenants. That was called Pruitt, Pruitt Igo, Igo. Right. and that was named after him. It was. It wow, was. and Igo was a uh, state representative. Presented, Not he was a right. state representative, he was a U.S. congressman. Right. But uh, the black part was Pruitt, and the white part was Igo. Didn't know that either. Right. But uh, so Pruitt was uh, named uh, after, well, that his name was used after that, uh, for that development. Right. Bruno Pruitt died in a plane crash in, in, Tus in Tuskegee, mm -hmm. Alabama. Mm -hmm. And the plane that he was using mm -hmm. was not as uh, maintained as planes he were used that to. That was tragic. And Solomon, I got to have you back to talk more about this. Okay. In fact, we're going to put some documentaries and things together where, to celebrate what's happening on August 30th, that big celebration, and yeah. uh, put some things together. Thank you so much for coming in and oh, talking with welcome. me about Window Pruitt and the you're mural welcome. at uh, Lambert Airport. People get out there. It's at Gate C. You can't miss it at Exit 11. So get on by and check it out. Go off of Black History Month and enjoy it. And check out the 10th Street Gallery as well. And go on down and say hello to, to Mr. Mr. Thurman and buy some of his artwork. How about that? <laughs> <laughs> Thank oh, you so much for coming on the show. Thank I you, I really Robin. appreciate it. Thank you. Thanks. And stay tuned. We've got more great information coming up. I'm Robin Boyce, and welcome back to City Corner. In the studios with me right now, I have Mr. David Burzak, who is chief of the NGA Corporate Communications West, and he's here to talk with us more about the NGA and them now spreading themselves out 
uh, further north in the city from where they are right now, you're, you, you're located right now on South St. Louis in a building where they've been for since 1952, you said? That's correct. Right, right. and yeah. I did not realize they were in the old Globe Democrat building at one time. When, uh, when one of our predecessor agencies, we first came into St. Okay. Louis as the aeronautical chart plant in, uh, in the early 40s, in about 1943. And uh, we were in the, what is now the Globe Building there for a while. And we moved down to the uh, St. Louis Arsenal down on South 2nd right. Street in 1952. Right. And we've been there ever since. That is really interesting history. The NGA, what does this particular government agency do? What, what, do, what is, I, I hear mapping, I hear satellites. So what, what does that agency do for the government? Robin, we do all of that. The, mm -hmm. uh, we, we provide geospatial intelligence for national level policymakers, so for the president and national command authority, and then also we provide uh, those types of mapping products and terrain products and uh, the geospatial intelligence for uh, those, our service members. We're, okay. a direct, we're a combat support agency under the Department of Defense, and we provide that direct support mm -hmm. to the warfighter. Um, mm -hmm. Kind of a, an odd, not an odd mission, but a third mission that we provide is as a result of the availability of commercial imagery, uh, we provide a lot of direct support to first responders in response to national disasters Very or good. other type of emergencies such as wildfires or um, hurricanes or tornado support. So you, you all are the folks that can see stuff from out of space and kind of beam down on it and say, hey, hot spot over here, this may be what you want to look at, or you might want to do something differently over here because it looks like this part of the earth may be changing or something like that when helping out uh, uh, people. Correct. We, um, we have the ability to task both government and commercial uh, resources, whether that be a satellite or commercial image or uh, uh, aerial imagery or that kind of thing. So mm -hmm. that's where it comes from that geospatial intelligence, where we talk about imagery mm -hmm. and imagery intelligence, which is principally, it's the information you can get off of a, an aerial photo. Mm -hmm. So you might look down at a building and we would have folks, analysts, right. who can tell the height of that building and, and other facilities or other structures in relation to that. So if there is something in question to support our warfighters or other type of national policy, we would look at those activities that are occurring in those areas, mm -hmm. analyze those images, overlay other type of information, whether it's terrain data, urban information from maps, that kind of thing, or then also when it comes to precision navigation, uh, we take into account um, the models of the Earth, the gravitational models, the magnetic models, and so that pilots, military and government pilots can mm -hmm take that information and load it into their cockpit computers and their inertial navigation systems to allow our warfighters and those flying our planes mm -hmm. to get to their mission safely and get home safely. How interesting. Moving over into the area where you're going now, which is probably a Cass and Jefferson area over there, um, this looks like this is going to be a new facility for you here in St. Louis compared to where you are on Arsenal and you had been in, in the past over with, with the Globe Democrat building. Um, have taking in the mind, the mindset of employees, um, you've got some special designs and renderings I had, I pulled down. It looks like it's going to be a nice place to work, what the, the, the NGA is putting together. And they're taking a vast piece of land over there and they're building from the ground up to really uh, not only, um, they, they didn't have any renders of what was going on the inside, or at least I didn't get, get any, but on the outside, it looks like it's going to be a nice place to want to come to work and, and, and enjoy being there. It looks neat. I really like it. Well, I'm glad you like the drawings. Mm -hmm. It's uh, uh, Sue Pullman, who is in charge of our office, to go ahead and bring that project uh, to bear for NGA. Um, she likes to talk about, make, she's in charge of the pretty. Oh, um, but, but, it is pretty. But in reality, we do want a place that the employees want to come to work to, but yeah. also attracts a future workforce as well. Yes. If you look around, uh, any type of, of uh, you know, in the past, oftentimes facilities that are involved with defense work might be just, you know, look like a concrete block building. Mm -hmm. Very, very austere, just, uh, you know, not attractive at all. And we're trying to change that. We don't, we, that wouldn't fit into the community. That would not fit into that area as, sure. at all. Mm -hmm. And we're aware of that. And we're trying to make something that uh, is attractive to our workforce now, mm -hmm. future generations mm -hmm. of the workforce, but also to the local community. We don't want this to stand out as an eyesore. So. I don't think it's going to do that at all. Um, when it comes to that workforce, the um, outreach that NGA is going to do, are you working with any of the school systems here or folks in the community who would like to train young people 
that future workforce to come and work for the NGA? Because I know in a lot of situations you're looking at folks who are retiring now. We've got a big, a big a baby boomer group that's moving on out. So to fill those seats up, is NGA going to reach out into the community to bring folks in? We are doing outreach into the community. We recognize that by the time we occupy and we're looking at moving into that facility in 2025 that a lot of our new employees or a lot of folks we have a very uh, active internship program for college students the the students that would be applying for that internship when we move into that building are in eighth grade today okay we need to somehow we need to reach out to to those um, students and those young people and inspire them to uh, to be interested in, in that type of field, the type of field that we would do, that, the geospatially related activities. And, but also, we want to encourage in them just that, because we're public servants. Mm -hmm. You know, we're federal employees, so yes. we want to instill maybe that sense of patriotism, maybe that sense of public service, and, and try to in inspire in our young people mm -hmm. the desire to do that and, and serve that cause beyond themselves. Mm -hmm. And we recognize that that doesn't just occur at an internship at college right. level, but it, it, it occurs before that. And we are working very closely with a number of the school districts to try to put some agreements into place that we can uh, provide uh, mentorships. We already, uh, as we can, we go ahead and provide people to be judges at science fairs. And we Excellent. attend a lot of career fairs and that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. Because when our employees go out and meet with students, part of what they do is they talk about what they do, mm -hmm. but they talk about what inspired them to do that. And hopefully we can get that sparked in someone else and they say, you know what, I want to do that. Right, that, that, that will make a huge difference. I'm seeing a lot now in some of the high schools where they're teaching young people about the GPS system that have a lot to do with what you guys do too, right, with reference to mapping and finding things. Um, um, uh, a lot of the young people are interested who are mm -hmm. in high school level in learning more about those kind of mapping systems and, and, and moving into them and, and getting interested in that. Um, hopefully high school students would have an opportunity as well to do internships or is that too young um, a group of individuals to bring at that point and, and you guys are more interested in the college individuals gone through courses at this point. We are looking at the uh, at what would be the opportunities for high school mm -hmm. students as well. There are just certain there are some things that we have to work through that as sure. far as um, because when we bring an intern on board, they've already gone through a background investigation for a security clearance, and we just mm -hmm. have to look at um, you know if somebody's younger than 18, what type of information would be available respecting their privacy and that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. So it's a we just have to work through how we can do some of the details with that, but that is something we're interested in pursuing. That agency probably employs how many people at this time in uh, the St. Louis area? Uh, in the St. Louis area, we have our facility at 2nd Street, but then we also have a facility in Arnold. And between oh. the two, we have uh, approximately about 30, 3, 3,700, 3,800 people, but roughly about 3,200 would be moving from the Second Street facility to the uh, new oh, facility. Okay, so will there be more people added to that going into the new facility or, or more people, more workers? The, I guess. No, the plan right now is that the, the people, the roughly 3,200 mm -hmm. people that are at Second Street would move into the new facility. Got you. And then Arnold will stay uh, where it is. Got you. I knew it was a real big deal for a long time on um, where the NGA would go. Mm -hmm. Um, the staying here in St. Louis was something that the, uh, I guess the, the decision makers decided that this would be the best way to do it, to stay here in St. Louis and make a difference. Most of the folks who work there are from the St. Louis area, right? Or 70% of the workforce you know I mean? is in yeah. the Saint, lives on this side of the river, yes. uh, Missouri. We have about 30% of our workforce that, that lives over in Illinois or other areas. Okay, okay. Yeah. So um, them staying here really is going to make a difference for businesses, you think, as the, the NJ begins to grow and build? And you're talking about a 2025 uh, or 27 opening? or being able to move folks in there? Right, we'd be moving in there in 2025. Um, it's exciting to see some of the activity focused on that. You see a lot of the activities here with the city and even the state wanting to make this a kind of a geospatial center of excellence. And yeah. I think a lot of that is, I don't, I'm not sure that everybody really recognizes just how much we rely on uh, geospatial or geographic information. Exactly. Um, you know, everything from or, you know, every day we use our handheld devices mm -hmm. to navigate someplace, mm -hmm. and so that uses a In GPS In the cars now, right? That's right. And um, you look at a precision time signal that drives devices like maybe, um, you know, electronic locks kind of thing that mm -hmm. you derive from the, the mm -hmm. time piece or the, the GPS satellite. Um, we rely on that information 
every day and everything we do and it not wasn't just us it was you know precision agriculture it was yeah. um, you know rental cars around the globe it was all those sort of things that we think about in navigation that um, really had a lot of people doing that here in the st. Louis area right so now we're kind of coalescing and trying to work out um, how we can make this more attractive to more of those types of business and industry. Mm -hmm. So I think there's a, there's a lot of activity, a lot of movement afoot to do that now. Mm -hmm. And so it's pretty exciting to be a part of that and, and included in that community. That this is, really sounds exciting. I'm sure that the employees are excited about moving in a new space. They're always <laughs> looking forward to moving in a new space. And, and in the surrounding areas, I'm sure this is going to affect the businesses, business growth in that area as, as well, having individuals um, in uh, in coming into that building who would do business outside of there. We're, we're going to see more businesses grow. Also, um, does uh, the NGA do a lot of work with contractors and subcontractors as well? Uh, we do. We, um, I mean, we have, just like any type of a military installation, yeah. we have a facility. We would need people to go ahead and do the maintenance or then um, contract folks in to do, you know, like electrical work or base maintenance and okay. those kind of things. So we have a lot of those types of activities that uh, on a normal recurring mm -hmm. basis, um, notwithstanding the fact that as the construction is ongoing, there would be a number of opportunities for construction jobs and other small businesses with some of the other facilities that are going to be small business set aside contracts. Yeah, that's going to make a, a huge difference for the area. Hopefully we're going to see uh, a nice boom in the area where um, what the NGA brings, it will outgrowth around the area and as as you said make it pretty make the <laughs> area look pretty because there's so many things that are going I mean there are museums down there that are in the surrounding area uh, the 14th Street Mall could start just booming and, and blowing up again because the individuals who were at the NGA could leave there and go and shop and do what have you and other um, grocery stores are coming into the area so it looks like the NGA is going to not only come bring in um, employees from other areas but also improve what's going on in the area at this time, really giving it that burst or that growth mm. to the area. It, it's exciting when you talk about what we're bringing there too, yes. but as we've been up there and getting more in, involved with some of the neighborhood groups, yes. it's really exciting to see what already goes on there with the neighbors and the, the community there, and it's That's exciting already. that we're gonna be a part of that and looking at how we can be a good neighbor in that community. Well, we appreciate it here in the St. Louis area, and we're so glad it landed in that spot right there because it's going to make a big difference. Thank you so much for coming on and talking with us about NGA and what's going on. And we want to thank you for tuning in to City Corner. Come on back next time. We've got a lot more great information. If you want to check out what's going on with the NGA, we have all the information there. Follow what's going on, other things that may open up, some of the activities that will be coming to the area. We thank you very much for tuning in again to City Corner, and we'll see you the next time. Thank you.